CBB color presentation. This is the private Joseph F. Merrill of the Staten Island Ferry. Over there, the Statue of Liberty holding her torch over the harbor. A gigantic stone shepherdess guarding her flock of islands and boroughs. Manhattan, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. Where we're headed is probably the least known of all five parts of New York City, Staten Island. We'll find farms and marshes and secret woodlands right here in America's biggest city today as Discovery comes home to New York City. Discovery 67, the award-winning program for young people with Bill Owen. A very special season is coming on ABC. Your father's alive. He can't be. He was frozen 67 years ago. He melted. Now, a man who's been on ice, so to speak, for 67 years, well, he's got some catching up to do. Bye. Golly, there's a midget in that box. <laughs> well, not bad for 101. No, wait, what language are you talking? That's a new language called 1967. Is that a part of the language? That's very much a part. Let's go, son. Life and laughs begin with the second hundred years in color on ABC. This is a farm in New York City. It isn't just near New York City. Every inch of this farm lies within the city limits of New York. Today on Discovery, we're going to spend some time in a part of the city that isn't all high-rise office buildings and apartment houses where families live by the dozen. This is a corner of the city where the geese honk more loudly than the automobiles do. This is the Crampanis farm. Mr. Crampanis has been farming here in New York City since 1911. His son is a farmer too, and he says he has no intention of doing anything different. He obviously believes there's a future in farming in America's biggest city. The Crampanis farm is a truck farm. That term started when it was applied to farms whose produce was transported to rural markets, transported by truck. But in the case of the Crampanises, people come to them to buy what they have raised in the soil of the city of New York. The Crampanis farm's customers come from Staten Island, of course, but they come from New Jersey, too, and from Brooklyn, across the new Verrazano Bridge. However, most of the produce of the Crampanis farm is sold in Manhattan at the famous Washington Market. Sadly, though, there are very few farms left on Staten Island. One look at the farmer's market tells the story. This market near Tottenville on the southern tip of Staten Island used to be a going concern. Farmers came from all over the island to sell. Now it stands empty and abandoned. It's peeling paint and it's weathered boards visibly cringing under the threat of the building boom which has come to Staten Island. Where there are increasing numbers of people, there must be apartments for them to live in. Even the apartment tells the story of our cities. When you cannot any longer build out across the fields, you must build up into the skies. There must be offices if people are to work. There must be schools if there are more school children. This is public school 23 at the corner of Wilder Avenue and Natick Street in Staten Island, New York. It was opened two years ago. Until then, children in Richmond Town went to learn each day in this school. This building is used as a maintenance shed, but it was once a schoolhouse. It wasn't ever very comfortable. And I suppose authorities today would be embarrassed about its lack of efficiency. 
but it was a schoolhouse where a schoolhouse was needed. Not very far from here, there's a little town whose name tells us something about the past of the island. Huguenot. It's named after the Huguenots of France, who were Calvinist Protestants in a Catholic country. Persecuted in their own country, many of them fled to Canada and to the United States, seeking religious freedom. Obviously, some Huguenots settled on Staten Island more than 150 years ago. They founded a town and gave it the very name for which they'd been made to suffer in their own country. They called the place they wanted to live Huguenot. Whether the people of Huguenot today realize why their town is so named is an open question, but the street names hold at least a clue. There are names in the few square miles surrounding me like Jeanette, Pierre, and Notre Dame. But a mile away, the names are Dutch. A stream in Dutch is called a kill, and you'll find Arthur Kill and Great Kills and Fresh Kills and Great Fresh Kills. This is the end of Staten Island, the tip. Amboy Road ends as the beach begins. If you're a boy of 11 with a bicycle and some friends, those congested apartment buildings and the city life they represent might as well be on the moon. Peter Cruz is a Staten Island youngster who lives at 216 Winchester Avenue in Eltingville. His world is full of friends and fun and animals and curiosity. We'll see more of that world and a basement menagerie filled with rabbits, guinea pigs, birds and white mice in just a minute. A very special season is coming on ABC. This is the Convent Santanco in Puerto Rico. The gusty trade winds that swirl around are something we sisters have learned to cope with. But to Sister Batril, our new novice from America, these lively breezes came as a bit of a shock. However, Sister Bertrille was as much of a shock to some of us. She was 90 pounds of young ideas, boundless energy, and charm. She immediately set out to solve some of our problems, applying some rather unusual talents. Until one day, she displayed the most remarkable talent of all. <gasps> Good grief! The wind lifts me up like this, you see. Now I can go down like this, and I go off that way. Or I can go down like this, or I go off that way. Sally Field takes off as the Flying Nun. Watch for her, in color, on ABC. Peter Cruz has at the moment one cat, one dog, one horned toad, one budgie, two hamsters, 12 white mice, and several rabbits, including this one, named Timothy J. Abernathy II. Peter has been interested in animals and natural history since he was old enough to realize there were four-footed creatures beyond the family dog. His teachers have encouraged him in these interests, and his natural intelligence has moved him along to the point where he qualifies as a remarkable young naturalist. His next furry goals are a baby raccoon, he has an older friend who's promised to help him find one, and he's saving his money till he has $25 for a young skunk, because he's learned through his reading that skunks will respond to careful training. It isn't just Peter's own interest and the help of his parents and teachers that have enabled him to become as familiar with animals as he is today. Something else has helped him too, Staten Island. Pretty deep woods for New York City. This is a place in Great Kills, which the youngsters of the island call Fairyland. Here there are snakes and toads and frogs, chipmunks and turtles, squirrels and snails, living in comparative peace and quiet, carrying on their natural lives, uninterrupted, except for the youngsters who come here to watch them. By coming here, by finding out for himself about the world of toads and lizards and frogs, how our world works, Peter Cruz has created for himself the basis of what his profession may one day become. He may be a naturalist, he may be a biologist, he may be a teacher or a doctor. Whatever he is, he will owe some of it to the freedom of discovery. 
personal discovery that was granted him by this deeply wooded area of Staten Island. When he was nine, there was more of it. When he was seven, there was still more. When he is 13, it may have vanished completely. All of this will probably one day be a victim of the demands for structures of steel and concrete, which are being built all over Staten Island. Even now, this lovely ravine is being destroyed by automobile wrecks that people have thoughtlessly dumped here. Peter remembers when he could catch tadpoles and frogs right where I'm standing. But now the stream has almost disappeared and the water is polluted. Peter and his friends may be among the last generation of boys in New York City proper who could find bullfrogs and garter snakes in a corner of the woods near their home. When the woods and great kills are just a memory trapped in concrete, there will still be a corner here and there on Staten Island reserved for animals and boys who want to learn about them. Some will be officially run by the city. Others will be less formal, a product of individual concern, like this one. Philip Hickeys lives on Sprague Avenue in Staten Island's town of Tossleville. He's a retired butcher who's as interested in animals as Peter is. He's also interested in the youngsters of Staten Island. He bought the lot next to his house and turned it into a zoo for children, just as you see it now. Here, Peter and his friend, or any boy or girl for that matter, can come and get to know animals they recognize and animals that are new to them. There are ponies, goats, monkeys, and even a golden pheasant. There's no charge, but if a child has a nickel, he can spend it on a handful of pumpkin seeds to feed a monkey. Seeing a capuchin monkey eye to eye is a strange experience, even for a lad as familiar with animals as Peter. And to actually hold and examine a squirrel monkey is an experience he doesn't have every day of the week. Mr. Hickey's enjoys both the animals and the children. And occasionally, a young visitor to his farm is lucky enough to see a three-day-old baby rabbit who hasn't even had time to grow any fur. Life's a little more relaxed in this part of New York City than it is in Manhattan, at least for parents of boys with bicycles. There aren't so many cars around, and in some of the places Peter likes to go, you could convince yourself that you'd be transported for a moment to a small town in Iowa or Nebraska. Out here, it's difficult to think of yourself as living in New York City and having much of anything to do with the problems besetting a great, teeming metropolis. Out this way, Peter and his friends play basketball and baseball, look for small animals in the woods, and bicycle down a country road to buy rabbit food. Hi, Mr. Bennett. Hello, Peter. Could I have 50 cents worth of Why, rabbit certainly. pellets, please? Certainly, sir. How many rabbits you have, Peter? Two. Two. What color are they? They're both white with uh, black noses and black ears. Oh, this ought to feed you rabbits for about a week, I should say. Well, Okay. Uh, thank you. Yes. Up at the other end of the island, there's still another world for them to investigate, right in Staten Island's front yard, where the lady next door is the Statue of Liberty. More about that in just a minute. You know, I sort of push it in and scoop it out. I like to eat ice cream. I never dropped it. Never. Good. Just one time I did. I love ice cream. I don't know why. Ice cream is best in a cone. But it's good. I like ice cream in the fall, the summer, every day on a winter, and spring. I guess that's all. I like vanilla the best, but sometimes I like chocolate better, you know what I mean? It's good like in the afternoon in a cone. I like nutsy banana. What's that? It's Borden's newest ice cream flavor. Creamy banana ice cream with lots of nutsy crunch. So much fun to eat, like real bananas. Only better, because it's ice cream. Ice cream, I love it. Enjoy nutsy banana this month. 
It's delicious, cold, and creamy. Take it from Elsie. Tastes good. How do you know? I know. We ought to remind our parents not to do those same old silly things every year, like starting forest fires. Smokey says, drown out your campfire. Stir the ashes and drown it out again. Smokey has a big black nose, and when he sees a fire, he comes running up and blows it out. He blows the flower out. Smokey the Bear is 181 years old. Oh, only I could put in a forest fire. I like Smokey the Bear because he likes Batman. You see, it's just like this. He don't go play with his matches, right? Smokey says when you go camping, take some water along so you can drown your campfire and so you won't get thirsty. Parents who smoke cigarettes shouldn't throw them away in the woods. I like Smokey Bear. I'm gonna buy Smokey a present because he loves me. Smokey, I don't buy your present. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Up at this end of Staten Island, it isn't all fields and marshes and houses and woods. This is Stapleton, the first place on the island to be settled. Sitting here in Stapleton Park, you might think you were in a small city in New Jersey, or perhaps a coal town in Pennsylvania. It's been lived in and worn down a bit. This is the hard nose that Staten Island points toward Manhattan. But this is where the harbor is, with Miss Liberty and Governor's Island and all the rest of it, like toys floating in the bathtub. And once in a while, if you've got a nickel, you can take a ride on the Staten Island Ferry. just a way of getting somewhere. It's a 20-minute ride in open water with some spectacular and world-famous scenery. It's also an institution in New York City, having been on the scene officially since 1884, and unofficially a couple of hundred years before that. 290 gallons of bunker fuel are needed to take the private Joseph F. Merrill across five miles of seawater and back. The rush hours are crowded, but in between there are quiet times. On some runs, the private Joseph F. Merrill doesn't even take in enough nickels to pay for the fuel. The line about a pleasure cruise for five cents is time-worn, but it's true, too. <laughs> Though the Staten Island Ferry is a pleasure cruise, it can also be an obstacle race. If you're 11 and you want to see it all, you've watched the craft's departure from the port side. Then, for the Verrazzano Bridge, you'll want to cross to starboard. Then, for the Statue of Liberty, it's to port again. Next thing, an army base on an island. Fort Jay on Governor's Island. Like everything else in New York City, the American Indians used to own it. Then the white man bought it, giving specific little in return. Governor's Island is said to have brought the embarrassing sum of two axe heads and a handful of nails. People in Staten Island claim the youngsters there don't feel much of a connection with the Manhattan part of the city of New York. They may go in to visit a museum or go to Radio City or perhaps the Bronx Zoo. But feel a part of it or not, they still line up to look at it as it rises up, seeming almost to be moving toward them instead of they to it. difficult part of the journey for the captain. In the pilot house with its three-foot diameter wheel, the captain must face one of the odd facts about New York Bay. Out here in the bay, the current of the water flows east. In just a moment, in nearer the slips, it will shift abruptly and flow west. If the captain were to lose control of his wheel at this point, 
he might miss the birthing slip entirely. Inside here, you'll find a small boy's dream world of dials and switches. But with all that, it's still the captain's skill and knowledge that tell him how the wind and the currents lie. If he knows where the breezes are, he knows how to take her in. Most passengers on the ferry boats are residents of Staten Island who commute each day to their jobs in Manhattan. As soon as the boat touches shore and the gangways are in place, they rush to catch the subways and buses that will take them uptown. In the evening, they'll return here and ride back across the harbor to Staten Island. The Joseph P. Merrill waits in Manhattan just long enough to take on passengers. And then she begins her return journey. The big city part of New York doesn't hold a great deal of fascination for Peter Cruz and his friends, but the trip over and back is still worth two nickels and is its own reward. On the way back, they get a closer look at a famous lady. She's watched the ferries come and go for 80 years. She's 152 feet tall and is made of copper sheeting more than three inches thick. She stands for freedom and liberty. And near her, there's a little island, which in days too long in the past for Peter to have known about them, presented the first step toward that freedom for new Americans. Ellis Island was a clearing station for the more than 20 million immigrants who came to America from all over the world in search of a new life. For years now, the buildings have been empty and unused, but soon the entire island is to be made into a park and a museum, dedicated to all those who immigrated through it and helped build this nation. New York possesses one of the world's largest and most exciting harbors. From the decks of the Staten Island Ferry, every imaginable kind of ship can be seen. Firefighting boats, tugs pushing railway freight cars, and giant luxury liners that sail across the ocean. As the ferry approaches the docking area, the passengers move toward the Staten Island end of the boat. If the boat is full, the captain has to take this last-minute weight shift into his plans. It's 20 minutes from St. George on this side to Lower Manhattan on the other. 20 minutes to a life over there that the people here would think of as too cluttered and too hectic, and a life here that some people there might find dull and provincial. All those places and all those points of view within the limitless limits of New York City. Staten Island named Staten by Dutch explorer Henry Hudson in honor of his patron, still worth a little further exploration by an 11-year-old American who hasn't quite yet found out all its secrets. We'll be back in just a minute. Here's a new kind of pudding, man. You can make it. It's called Shake a Pudding. See the crazy ways to shake it. Shake, shake, shake a pudding. Shake it at the pool, shake it for dessert, shake it at the school. New Shake-A-Puddin' dessert mix with cups and lids and spoons to make four puddings. Water and powder go in the cup, snap on the lid and then you shake it up. Shake, shake, shake a puddin'. Shake it on the side, shake it on your back. Any way you shake it, you've got a crazy snack. Vanilla. Crazy. Butterscotch. Crazy. Banana. Shake a pudding? Shake a pudding? Shake a pudding. 
taste of pudding. New from Royal. What a crazy way to make a snack. Shake, shake, shake a pudding. A sea monster? Nonsense. Oh. I'll hold his attention. You go below and fire a broadside. <laughs> yeah, well, sea monster, sir. Uh, have a taste of Captain Crunch. Uh, the cereal, I mean. Uh, Captain Crunch is already sweetened for you, and it stays crunchy even in milk. It tastes better without the bowl. Ready? It was really my arch enemy, Magnolia Bulkhead, and her pirate submarine. Imagine, a sea monster that eats cereal. Ridiculous. Ridiculous? Oh, I wouldn't say that. It's from Quaker. Join us next week for another exciting discovery program. And thanks for being with us for Discovery Comes Home to New York City. If you want to know more about the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and Manhattan, and the people who live there, then ask your librarian for these books. The Key to New York by Alice Fleming. John Kieran's Natural History of New York City. And It's Like This, Cat, by Emily Neville. Bye-bye. The Discovery Production Unit's domestic transportation arrangements and production consideration provided by United Airlines. This has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News and Public Affairs. Discovery 67 has been brought to you by... Captain Crunch. Captain Crunch, you're on. Captain Crunch is the new cereal from Quaker that stays crunchy, even in milk. Prevent blindness. For a free pamphlet, write Prevent Blindness, Box 426, New York 10019. We ought to remind our parents not to do those same old silly things every year, like starting bars fires. Smoky the bed, so strong. Maybe I could prevent forest fires. I like Smoky the bed because he likes Batman. Smoky says not to play as much as you get burnt. I love Smoky the I'm going to buy Smokey a present because he loves me. Smokey, I'll buy you a present. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires.